Hello, everybody, and welcome. Greetings from sunny Southern California, and welcome to today's Flipgrid Live event. I'm your host, Anne Cosma from Team Flipgrid, and together we are going to visit the Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium to learn all about sea turtles. Sea turtles have roamed our oceans for more than 100 million years, but many species are now facing extinction. Today, you are going to learn how you can help these amazing animals, and also you will discover how scientists are helping them survive. All right, friends, I know you are just as excited as I am. So without further ado, let's meet Jason Robert Shaw from the Moat Marine Laboratory. Hello, Jason, welcome. Hello and welcome, thank you so much. Greetings from sunny Sarasota, Florida, uh, where I'm here to talk about one of my favorite animals, the sea turtles. We're gonna learn oh, Jason, all about their adaptations and conservation today. Awesome, we are thrilled. We are just so excited to have you here today. And folks tuning in, if you have any questions for Jason, be sure to submit them using the Q&A chat feature on the side of your screen. We're also going to have a chance to take a selfie with Jason and maybe a special guest later on. So Jason, take it away. Thank you so much, Anne. And thank you everyone for tuning in today uh, to learn a little bit about how Moat helps the ocean and helps sea creatures. Now to get us started, let me go ahead and show you exactly where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, we're gonna learn today that we are coming to you from Sarasota Bay here. Uh, right in the middle of Sarasota Bay is City Island and that's where you'll find Moat Aquarium. We're open 365 days of the year. It's a public aquarium. So if you are in the mood to travel this summer and uh, you get a chance to come over to Florida, maybe you could stop by and visit us and actually see some of the creatures we're gonna be talking about today. And Moat got its start all the way back in the 1950s with this remarkable woman named Dr. Eugenie Clark. She actually founded our laboratory on shark research, but we have since expanded to over 20 other research programs, including sea turtles. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We have three programs that deal with sea turtles here at Moat, including our sea turtle conservation and research program. These folks go out on our beaches every single day during sea turtle nesting season and check out all of the uh, mama sea turtles that are coming up and laying eggs on our beaches. We also have a sea turtle hospital. Sometimes ocean wildlife needs a little bit of TLC and extra help. And so these fine folks from our sea turtle hospital will actually rescue and try to rehabilitate sick and injured sea turtles and then if things do go wrong, we have this incredible program called Strandings Investigation. It's kind of like an animal CSI team. They can actually go out and uh, figure out what's happened to animals and maybe help uh, make better decisions for resource managers and biologists in helping to protect these creatures. Now today, in order for us to learn a little bit about what makes a sea turtle a sea turtle, I thought we could play a little bit of a game and uh, I like to call it Reptilian Million. So let's see if you can play along with me. I'm going to ask you a series of questions and you can just type into the chat or answer for yourselves there wherever you're located and uh, see if you can follow along and do your best with these. And they're pretty straightforward, pretty easy. And we're going to talk about reptile characteristics. What makes a reptile a reptile? And then see how those apply to sea turtles. So let's go ahead and start with feathers, lays eggs, scales, slime, teeth, backbone, warm-blooded or cold-blooded. Which one of these characteristics belongs to a reptile and by extension to a sea turtle? All right, I get a uh, lays eggs is the most popular answer. If you guess that, we are creating In fact, none of sea turtles are on our beaches as I speak. Uh, they are nesting season right here in Florida right now. And a mom sea turtle can lay up to 100 times each uh, time she nests, and she can nest up to 10 times per season. So. Do a quick little mental math with me. A hundred eggs, 10 times, what do you end up with? Yeah, over a thousand eggs per season, sometimes more, sometimes less. And uh, right now we have a lot of loggerhead sea turtles coming up on our beaches and nesting right here in Florida. And as you saw, the sea turtle patrol goes out on a regular basis to check those nests and make sure that they're protected. All right, you're doing great with our game. Let's go ahead and head on back to reptilian millions and see if you can get another characteristic of a sea turtle and a reptile. Reptiles have feathers, teeth, 
Scales. I'm seeing some folks guessing scales. So let's check out that if you did guess scales. Scaly skin and special scales on their back called scoots. That's one of your science words for today, scoots. It's a special term we use for the scales on a sea turtle. And the pattern of scoots on a sea turtle actually helps scientists tell the different species apart. Now, to help us figure out a little bit more about how this works, I have a special friend here with me today. Now, it's not a sea turtle, but it is a sea turtle cousin. This is my friend Sam, the box turtle. Again, he is not a true sea turtle, but he is related to sea turtles. He is a type of turtle. It's a terrestrial turtle that we find here in North America, especially on the eastern part of the United States. And you can see that he has a unique pattern of scales on his back. These are what I'm talking about when I say scoots. Now he has some other body parts too, some other science words that I wanted to share with you today. The top of a turtle shell is a special word called a carapace. Can you say that with me? Carapace, that's the top of a sea turtle or a box turtle shell. And then the bottom part is called the plastron. Plastron's your other science word for today, scoots, carapace, and plastron. And that's what makes a sea turtle a sea turtle. Now, also, uh, you can see that, again, I said this is a terrestrial turtle. It likes to live on land. So you can compare that to the models that I have behind me. Do their legs look similar or different? What do you think, Sam? Yeah, they look very different. Those sea turtle models behind me, they have big front flippers to help them swim through the water. You can compare that to these big, chunky legs that Sam has for walking around on land and also digging. All right, Sam's gonna come back for our selfie time together and maybe help us learn a little bit more about reptiles in just a moment. But in the meantime, we're gonna go back to our game board and see how you all do with the other questions that I have for you about what makes a sea turtle a sea turtle and what makes a reptile a reptile. So let me jump on back to my game board here in just a second and see if you can guess the other characteristics. Slime, teeth, backbone, warm-blooded, cold-blooded. Now, if you said backbone, you'd be correct. Yes, yeah, sea turtles do have a skeleton inside that shell. Sam has one inside of there. They have a backbone. They are vertebrates. And you can actually see in that sea turtle model that we have in our exhibits there, you can see the backbone of the sea turtle. I happen to have a sea turtle shell in my studio here with me today, too, to show it to you. Now, this is a shell of a sea turtle called an olive ridley. And if I flip it around, you can see that there, in fact, is a spine connected to the back of a sea turtle shell. Now, a lot of people think that sea turtles can pop out other shells or that turtles can pop out other shells. We've seen that in cartoons, right, with Bugs Bunny and other characters. Well, unfortunately, that is not, or fortunately, that is not the case at all. In fact, sea turtles are connected to those shells, and they cannot uh, come out of them. Now, in the case of Sam, he can actually pull all of his limbs and his head into his shell if he needs to for protection. But sea turtles like the ones behind me, they can't do that. Their uh, shells are very sleek and hydrodynamic. I can actually show you over here on my models that I have in the studio. And you can see here that this is a land turtle, a Galapagos sea turtle. And it has a very high dome shell and these big feet made for walking. Compare that to my model model of a sea turtle here, which has a very sleek hydrodynamic shell, which is great for swimming through the water. In fact, sea turtles can really get going with these very powerful front flippers. They can get up to 30, 35 miles per hour underwater if they need to. Pretty cool. All right, we're going to go ahead and flip on back over to our game board because we have a couple more characteristics before we move on to learn about how moat protects these sea turtles out in our oceans. So let's go ahead and hop on back there and see how you do with the other characteristics. Did any of you say cold-blooded? That's kind of famously one of the characteristics of a reptile, right? They rely on their surroundings in order to warm up. They're not like you and I. We are mammals, and so we make our own body heat. Instead, they have to uh, rely on their surroundings. Now, there is one sea turtle group over in Hawaii. Sometimes they come up on beaches to kind of uh, bask in the sun, but for the most part, sea turtles stay in their ocean their whole life, except for those mamas who come up onto our beaches to nest. All right, I think we have one more characteristic before we move on here. So let me jump on back over here and see how you do. Feathers, slime, scales, backbone, teeth. No, oh, I think we got it. Lays eggs, scales, backbone, cold-blooded. Yep, we got them all. All right, so bonus question though, 
who did so well with these. Let's see if you can answer this. Sea turtles breathe using A lungs or B gills. What do you think? Yeah, they are air breathers. So they breathe by lungs. They come up to the surface and able to breathe. They're not uh, down in the ocean all the time. Um, they can hold their breath for a pretty long time, though. They can come up to the uh, surface about once uh, every 10 uh, minutes to five hours, depending on uh, what the water temperature is like and what they're doing. So, yeah, sea turtles are air breathers. They do have to come up to the surface occasionally in order to breathe. All right, you all did great with my first round of questions, so I'm ha so happy for that. And in a few minutes, you'll get your chance to ask me your sea turtle questions, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, let's continue on here. And I want to go on a sea turtle patrol with you and show you a little bit about what it's like uh, in the day in the life of one of our uh, resource uh, conservation volunteers. And so we're going to head out to the ocean and uh, check this out. And this is a typical day morning here in Florida. Our sea turtle volunteers go out even before the sun comes up and they go on patrol. They're looking for signs of mama sea turtles coming up on our beaches. And here you can see one of the nests that was laid and hatched the previous evening. We know that because we patrol them every day. So we saw signs that the baby sea turtles emerged from the nest successfully and crawled out the previous evening. So our volunteer has special permission to come aboard or come out here and actually dig up the nest. Why are they digging it up? Well, she is counting the number of eggs to see how many hatched successfully, how many were laid. And by knowing that kind of information, we can kind of see trends on the success or lack of success that sea turtles are having in our area. And as you can see, every once in a while when we dig up a nest, we find a little baby sea turtle that needs some extra TLC. And so after we're done counting the nest, we actually fill it back in because those eggs are part of the nutrient cycle of the beach. So we cover it back over, clear out the um, signs and markers because that nest is hatched, and we bring that little baby sea turtle back to our hatchling hospital. And just like any good scientist, we're going to take a lot of different data. We're going to take some measurements and figure out exactly what's going on with this little baby sea turtle. So my volunteer here is going to clean him up a little bit. Actually, we don't know if it's a boy or a girl yet. It's very hard to determine the uh, sex of a baby sea turtle. They actually don't start showing sexual characteristics until they're much, much older. And so uh, this could be a boy or a girl. We don't know yet. And so we measure it, we weigh it, and we write all of that information down. And then we'll actually put it into our little hospital area, along with any other hatchlings that are being wait, waiting to be released. And you can see those little marks there on the back. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, when you look at these little baby sea turtles, right, uh, they all kind of look a lot alike. And so we actually use a little waxy crayon to mark up the back of the uh, sea turtles, just so that we can tell them apart when we need to. That waxy crayon eventually wears off, and then we release them as close as possible to the beaches on which they were laid and those little baby hatchlings are released out into the ocean. Sometimes we'll actually have to go out into the seaweed line offshore if we have the hatchlings for a while uh, to release them in order to uh, get them out into the ocean and get a nice head start. And we've had a lot of success lately with our sea turtles. Uh, we've seen an increasing number of loggerhead sea turtles. We've been protecting and counting these uh, beaches for over uh, 25 years, I think now. Um, so we've been doing this kind of uh, uh, patrol and uh, protection. And uh, this is one of the things that we do here at Moat Marine Laboratory. Now, in addition to the uh, sea turtle patrol that you just saw, we also have a sea turtle hospital. So when we get sick and injured animals, uh, adults that need a little bit of extra help, uh, we can bring them into our hospital and actually protect them too. So I wanna show you a short little video about that and uh, learn a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes here at Moat. And after that, we'll head over to Ann for any kind of questions that you might have, maybe even a little bit of selfie time with Sam. So stay tuned. Keeping track of the health of our animals in our local environment is hugely important, not only for the animals, but it has a human impact as well. We work closely to respond to animals that are in distress or that find themselves beached. Well, all species we work with are great indicator species, our turtles, our dolphins, our whales. They're on the front line, so we start seeing issues with them in their environment. It's just a matter of time before it's starting to affect humans. 
Mood is one of those institutions that's well known in the conservation world. So our rehabilitation hospital, our main goal is to get those animals that come into us back out so they can then be a productive part of the population out in the wild. A lot of what we do is supportive care. And we also do surgical procedures um, as we have to take very subtle cues from these animals. It's a big team effort here to get these animals healthy again and get them back out into the oceans. People have come to expect Moat to do this. Not only are we doing a service for the community, but also for these animals that we think are really, really important. Any animal that's here would never have made it back out to the wild had we not helped. We have an opportunity here to really make a difference, doing everything we can to help with the health of the oceans. Yeah, so that's a little behind the scenes look there at our sea turtle rehabilitation hospital. And uh, one of the more fascinating things that we do, uh, in addition to uh, helping sea turtles recover, we also have a tagging program. Uh, we can actually put this little backpack on the back of a sea turtle and uh, help track it. And so you can go to moat.org to find out more about how we track uh, sea turtles out in the ocean. And uh, this is actually a harmless procedure. It doesn't uh, bother them, but it gives us a lot more information about the secret lives of sea turtles. All right, my friends, I have spoken quite a bit about sea turtles this afternoon or this morning, wherever you're tuning in from. And so now I want to hand it back over to Anne uh, to see where we're at. Uh, Anne, are you out there? I am, Jason. I have loved learning from you. And I remember those words, scoots, carapace, and plastron. So I was listening and loved hearing about the work that you're doing and the incredible conservation efforts from Moat Marine Laboratory. Now, friends who are listening in, I know you've learned so much too. And before we dive into your questions, I think it's time for a moment you've all been waiting for. It's a selfie time. So teachers, parents, friends, everyone who is watching, it's time to get your cameras out and gather in front of your screens, if you're in your classrooms, at home, in your office or your kitchen or wherever it is you're watching from, we'll give you a few seconds to get set up. Oh, and I see our special guest there with our friend. Folks, we'd love to see these pictures on social. So when you share them, please be sure to tag at Flipgrid and at Moat Marine Lab when you do share. Okay, Jason, are you ready? And is Sam the Fox Turtle ready? Yeah, he's ready. Everyone, All get right. ready. Cue the music, everybody. It's selfie Jason Sam. and our box turtle friend. I know we were going to see him in those selfies. Friends, be sure to share those with us. Post them on Twitter, post them on social, and tag us at Flipgrid. And be sure to tag our good friends at Moat Marine Lab as well. Now, Jason, we're almost ready for questions, but before we do, I wanted to share some shout outs to folks who are tuning in literally from all around. Hello, Mrs. Cope's class from Fort McLeod, Canada, and Mr. Edwards, fifth graders in Alberta, Canada, welcome. Danita from the Georgia Department of Education, Kamal and Samar from Bangalore, hello, special shout out to you. And Gemma is watching in New York. So we have friends tuning in everywhere, Jason. That's so cool. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in and uh, learning a little bit about my favorite friends, the sea turtles. Thank you. All right. Well, it is time for some of their questions, Jason. We've been having a lot of the learners drop their wonderings into the chat. So our first question is coming in from Lillian. And the question is, how many eggs do sea, sea turtles typically lay? 
Yeah, so that's a great question. And uh, let's see if I can switch over here to my uh, sea turtle nest that's gonna be coming in behind me. And you can actually see that mama sea turtles uh, typically come up onto our beaches about uh, 10 times a season. And each time they nest, they can actually nest and lay about uh, 100 eggs each time. So they dig this kind of uh, pit that you see here in my model of a sea turtle nest. And you can see all of those little tiny sea turtles um, down there at the bottom. And what happens is those little eggs, they're about the size and shape of a ping pong. They're not quite as hard as a ping pong. Uh, they're kind of soft and leathery. And uh, all of those little eggs sit underneath the sand for about uh, 60 days or so, uh, depending on the temperature. Kind of interesting thing about sea turtles is they are temperature dependent. Uh, you got uh, uh, hot uh, temperatures create more females and uh, cooler temperatures uh, create more male temperatures, uh, more, more male sea turtles. So it's kind of interesting, a little different biology than mammals. And uh, they sit underneath there for about uh, 60 days and then they hatch and they uh, have some cues from the environment, the temperature and the light, and then they'll kind of boil up to the top and wait for nightfall. They can sense the temperature of the sand, and once it's nightfall, they'll come up out of the sand and out into the ocean. And they look for the uh, brightest horizon on the uh, beach, which is typically the moon and the stars, uh, but here in Florida, sometimes we like to build on our beaches too, so we'll have condos and hotels on the beaches, and they have to follow special laws to kind of dim their lights and direct the lights away from the beaches so those sea turtles don't get confused and head the wrong way. So good question. Do we have some more? Oh, we sure do. Ms. Moreland's class is wondering, Jason, how long have you worked with sea turtles? Yeah, so Moat actually, as I said, got started all the way back in the 1950s, started out with shark research. And then here at Moat, we've been uh, studying the uh, local population of sea turtles for over 20 years. Uh, we actually, I think I have over 25 years of, of nesting data uh, on our beaches here in Florida. And then here at Moat, personally, I started back uh, about 20 years ago myself. And uh, this is what I do for a living. I actually get to talk to students and uh, families and groups just like you all over the world using this remarkable technology like Microsoft Teams. So uh, excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Well, we are loving learning from you, Jason. Now, 25 years of data is a lot. One of the questions asks, what is the heaviest sea turtle you've ever recorded at Moat Marine Lab? Yeah, so we actually, um, here in the west coast of Florida, near the Gulf of Mexico, uh, what we usually get are what are called loggerhead sea turtles. So I'm going to see if I can bring up some pictures of these different kinds of sea turtles. But the ones that, uh, the most unusual one we got is this. Does anyone recognize what this big sea turtle is? This is a leatherback sea turtle, and it's unusual for us to get these on the west coast. But we had one that kind of lost its way, so we went out and helped it. Uh, find its way back. It was actually on its way down to South America, but got turned around somehow. And over on the east coast of Florida, you'll see these as well. And these guys get uh, over a thousand pounds. They are absolutely huge. But here at Moat, we usually see sea turtles like this. This is a loggerhead sea turtle. Sometimes we do see green, see green sea turtles as well. Um, but uh, usually it's this kind, the loggerhead sea turtle that we see the most of. Good question. Do we have some more? Yeah, we sure do. Now, our friends Kamal and Samar from Bangalore are asking, given that the gender of sea turtles depends on temperature, they're curious about how climate change might impact the continuance of sea turtles. Yeah, and that is definitely a concern. Uh, it's just something that uh, we're beginning to wonder about. Now, an interesting thing about sea turtles is, do you remember which uh, uh, sea turtle comes up on the beaches? It's the females, right? They're nesting. So there's not a lot of information about male sea turtles. They usually spend their entire lives out in the ocean, and it's very hard to find them or study them. So whenever we get an opportunity to have one come into our shores, we usually try to tag it and uh, get information about those kinds of uh, male sea turtles out in the ocean. So it's a big question mark right now still. Uh, what effect uh, climate change will have on animals like sea turtles? Also, other reptiles are temperature dependent. Uh, with their uh, sex determination too. So it may affect them as well. And uh, we have yet to see what uh, will happen. The other thing too, is it takes sea turtles a long time to sexually mature. So it may take uh, decades before we see the uh, outfall uh, of any kind of changes to their environment that are happening right now. So uh, something definitely that we're paying attention to and trying to determine. Good question. Any others? Yeah, no doubt. A lot of a lot of time and attention spent researching that. Thank you for sharing. 
I personally have a question, and this happened one of my travels. I was at a beach, and I came upon a sea turtle that was up on the sand in the middle of the day. And I'm just curious if folks happen to be at the beach, if they come across a sea turtle, what are some best practices? Because my understanding is do not touch, do not interact with. What advice can you share with folks who might come across a turtle at the beach? Now, I'm curious, were you in Hawaii when you saw I that? Was. Yeah, I was. So that is one of the unusual areas where sea turtles do sometimes come up on our beaches and uh, they bask. And so we'll see them. But usually sea turtles stay out in the ocean. But if you do see a sea turtle, uh, all of them are protected in some level uh, by the federal government. And usually there's also state laws that protect them as well. So it's against the law to harass those kinds of creatures. You can't go up and disturb them, can't push them around. Uh, usually if you're out there swimming in the ocean and a sea turtle comes near you, just enjoy it. You've got that special privilege of seeing an incredibly uh, special animal, many of which are endangered, and allow it to go through its life and, uh, and, and enjoy it while it's there. Um, don't try to swim after it because, again, the sea turtles are very fast. They can get away from you super easily if they want to. Um, but uh, over in Hawaii, you do have the uh, Hanu experience. And so uh, follow along with your uh, eco uh, guides if you have one there or follow the uh, local laws if you uh, can get uh, information on those. But for the most part, you want to leave them alone. And then if you see an animal that's in distress, it's obviously not doing well. Uh, maybe it's got an injury or a boat strike or anything like that. Uh, contact the uh, police or the local wildlife agencies. Uh, here in Florida, we have a wildlife hotline that you can call as well. And then those folks from our CSI team, the Strandings team, uh, they'll go out and investigate and see if we need to rescue that animal or if it's doing okay. Good question. Do we have some more? Actually, we do have a final question, but I want to say thank you for sharing that advice because I know it's something that we all can listen and learn from. So thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, we, we did want to ask if you have any other final thoughts that you'd like to leave with the audience before it's time to go. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're interested in helping out with these kind of sea creatures here at Moat Marine Laboratory, you can actually adopt uh, a sea turtle. Uh, you can go to moat.org slash adopt to find out. Maybe you want to adopt one as a classroom or as a group. Uh, you can do that at various levels. It's not just sea turtles. We have manatees, sharks, and other sea creatures that you can help support. And then if you're somebody who likes seafood, you enjoy uh, eating animals uh, from the ocean, that's okay. But go ahead and do it responsibly uh, with the Seafood Watch Guide from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, they have this fantastic resource. It's kind of a color-coded guide. Uh, they've done the research to figure out which animals um, are sustainably harvested and well-managed and can be uh, caught. Um, if it's green, it's okay. If it's yellow, you want to be aware of any concerns. And if it's red, maybe you want to avoid it. So go ahead and check out the Seafood Watch Guide and help make uh, responsible seafood choices. And uh, that is one of the things that I wanted to share with you all today. Awesome, Jason. Thank you so much for being here with us today and celebrating our oceans and teaching us all about sea turtles. We had so much fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you from me and thank you from Sam. And I uh, hope to see you all again soon. We'll see you out there. That's for certain. Now, friends, thank you so much for listening. And we want to remind you that this July, we have events for families. You are all invited to join us for the first ever Summer Creativity Camp and hear from graphic novel authors and also participate in some really fun and super creative challenges right on Flipgrid. You can go to aka.ms slash Flipgrid Live Events to register for our Creativity Camp and be sure to share with your friends and families who might be interested in joining in as well. And friends, don't forget, you can ask all your ocean and turtle related questions directly to Jason and his team by using Flipgrid. You can visit flipgrid.com slash trek and join the conversation now. It has been so special sharing this time with you and learning together. We want to thank the Moat Marine Lab and Aquarium, and we want to thank you. Thanks for spending the last half hour with us. We are so grateful. Take care, everybody. Have a great day, and we'll see you soon. Bye.